It has a number of components. It has the master plan, which teaches you everything that you need to know from a broader perspective with the specific mechanics. And then we go into very specific applications of the memory skills. You are listening to EducationHackers.com, podcasting from Vancouver, Canada. Education Hackers highlights successful entrepreneurs with great online courses. And now to introduce today's guest is e-learning evangelist Steve Atwall. Today I'm pleased to have Anthony Metievia on the show. Anthony is the founder of the Magnetic Memory Method, a systematic 21st century approach to memorizing foreign language, vocabulary, dreams, names, music, poetry, and much more in ways that are easy, elegant, effective, and fun. Anthony, if we look at this age we are living in, we need to remember so many things. It's no longer like in the old days where we didn't have mobile devices and the internet pounding our heads with information upon information. We are living in an age where we can learn whatever we want and whenever we want, if we put our minds to it. But this also leads to expectations from our kids and adults to know more and do more. In today's show, we're going to dive into a course that addresses the memory side of knowing more. But before we do that, and before we get into your online courses, how do you like to relax when you're not working? How do you unwind? Do you have any hobbies? Yeah, well, I play bass. I've played bass for years in different bands, and I love to keep that up and keep playing. And I also really like walking a lot, and I often do what I call road work, which is I'll walk to a cafe and work for about an hour and then walk to the next one and uh, go through the city that way. And it's a lot of fun. So relaxing while working and I work standing at these cafes. So I'm on my feet a lot. And that that in and of itself is kind of relaxing once you get used to it. Yeah, that's that's kind of cool. Actually, I go for long 10 kilometer walks along the Fraser River here through the woods, uh, take pictures while I go. So it's not just about getting from point A to point B, and I see some people rushing about, and, and it's more of an exercise for them rather than a relaxation. So that's pretty cool. And is that the Fraser River in British Columbia? Yes, Fraser River in Vancouver, well, Burnaby, which is just next door to Vancouver. Okay, well, I'm from BC, so I know the area well. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, the part that I go to, I've seen some coyotes come out of those woods <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, they're pretty bold. <laughs> so, yeah, that's cool. So let's talk about your online course called Magnetic Memory Method. Give us a bird's eye view of the course. What do you cover? Who is it for? And why should people be signing up for it? Well, the Magnetic Memory Method Masterclass, it has a number of components. It has the master plan, which teaches you everything that you need to know from a broader perspective with the specific mechanics. And then we go into very specific applications of the memory skills. So how to memorize vocabulary of any language, how to memorize names and even their faces of people that you meet and how to memorize poetry, which extends to memorizing speeches and jokes and limericks and quotes and there's how to memorize a deck of cards, which is good for speed training and making your mind a lot more flexible in terms of coming up with images at a faster pace. So it's not really for competition or anything like that, but just a pure memory exercise that helps with everything else. And I also have a course on remembering your dreams, which is one of those elusive things that a lot of people wish they could do better and have greater access into what's going on during their sleep. And that's related to this. So it can also make you much more creative and make all the other memory techniques easier to use. So that's the masterclass and why people should take it and who should take it is anyone for whom memory is a critical issue and they have problems storing information and recalling it at will and they really feel the pain and frustration and often embarrassment and shame that comes from not being able to recall even the simplest information sometimes 20 seconds after you've looked at it or heard a name and you want to overcome that and be able to recall information years later just by using a few simple techniques so it's for really anybody who has memory as a concern now i i I've met some people, some older people that have issues remembering things. 
Now we're talking about people that are healthy people that don't have any other physical problems in terms of memory. Would this masterclass be appropriate for older people that can't remember certain things and their memory is fading as, as they call it? Yeah, absolutely. I have people in the masterclass who are in their late 80s and are getting great results. They have different goals, of course, than some younger people would, just wanting to retain poetry that they loved at earlier parts of their life or or they're even at that later age studying languages. It's surprising the amount of people who are learning languages so late in life, which is absolutely fantastic. And for anybody who is concerned that age might be a, a deterrent to learning memory techniques, the exciting thing about using memory palaces, which I ground the magnetic memory method on, is that there is very strong research and application going on using memory palace techniques to help Alzheimer's patients. And they're getting results in terms of just simply allowing people with this condition to retain the names of their loved ones. And so what this suggests, and we already know this, but it suggests that memory techniques can be curative for memory loss and also preventative. So it's never too late, in other words, to get some results from memory techniques and I'd probably a lot of results. That's awesome. That's very promising. Now, you talk about uh, memory palaces. Tell us what memory palaces are. Well, they are a mental construct that is that are based on any location that you're familiar with and ideally an indoors location like your home or a school or a church or a movie theater or a museum or a cafe or a restaurant. So long as you are familiar with it, then you can recreate it in your mind almost effortlessly because our the human brain has an absolutely insane ability, natural ability to recall places that it has seen and spent time in. This is less distinct with outdoor uh, locations, but very, very strong in indoor locations. And many people, if you ask them to remember their childhood home, they'll be able to draw a simple floor plan, tell you where their bedroom was in relation to their bathroom and to the kitchen and to the porch. And maybe there was a tree in the backyard and they'll be able to recall that virtually without any effort whatsoever. And that's good because it is a virtual element that you're creating in your mind. And what I've done is come up with some guiding principles because there's so many trainings or articles about building memory palaces and they're so vague and they don't really get into the nuts and bolts of it. And I was always really disappointed with that because I know that there are principles that you can use to build them in a much more ironclad way. So they serve a lot better. And so that's what I worked on and have been able to help lots and lots of people get a lot better results from memory palaces. But in brief, they're just an imaginary or mental version of a real location or even a fantasy location, but real locations work a lot better because they reduce the cognitive overload that your imagination needs in order to navigate through the memory palace where you're going to leave images that allow you to recall information that you want to be able to retrieve and in, in essence, memorize and recall it. So that's why you want to base it on a real location, at least as a beginner. Yeah, it's a, it's amazing what we remember based on certain locations and certain events that occur in our life. I mean, I remember when I was about five, six years old, and I remember, you know, what happened, uh, certain memories that stick in, in my mind. And it's not everything. It's, it seems to be certain events and certain places that stick in your mind. Now, you also talk about getting focused training without the fluff that fills most memory improvement books. And I and I, I actually totally believe in that because I see so many books that are basically like tombs and they're, they're full of information, great information, but it's a lot of theory. What I like to have is practical step-by-step -step techniques and exercises that help me do what I want to do. I think you focus on that as well in, in your masterclass by delivering step-by-step -step instructions and exercises. Now I'm going to read a testimonial from one of your students, and it goes something like this. Now I believe that I truly can learn anything. 
The greatest challenge is figuring out what I want to pursue next. I truly believe that your method is unique to anything else out there. It is groundbreaking. You have really opened my eyes and my mind to the potential of my mind. And I thank you so much for that. That's from Jeremy Lambert. So that's really, really high praise. And I see that a lot of students are very, very happy with your methods. What are some of the big questions that you get asked by students taking this course or your master class? Well, I get a lot of questions. Well, they're theoretical questions. I mean, you mentioned that uh, a lot of these books are filled with theory. And that's not bad in and of itself. But one of the reasons why I don't concentrate a lot on the theory is because the we don't really need it in order to actually just follow the steps. And it often gets in the way of following the steps. And if you did want the theory, then, or let's put it another way, a lot of people are interested in the scientific theory behind it rather than the theory of why the techniques work. And so people often ask me, what's the science behind it? Because they want that sort of element of qualification as if having some sort of demonstrable studies would convince them to take action a lot more. So I get questions about that. And I often just answer it with the World Memory Championships website. And they can look at the stats that people have, or I recommend them to a book on the science of memory, like from John Arden, for example. And they can get into that sort of thing. But I think that that's a distraction. I think that people use that as a means of not taking action because there's a bit of effort involved. And so my suggestion is always to take action first and then use the excitement of the results that you get to generate your research into the science rather than the other way around because you may never get back to actually using the techniques when you <laughs> start reading uh, the science behind it because this is one of the things that's so amazing about the whole world of memory is that people – get very fascinated by it. They get fascinated by it as a subject in and of itself. And a lot of people understand exactly what I'm teaching. They know why it works because intuitively you know why it works once you've learned the techniques, but they then get wrapped up in the labyrinth of possibility and never actually do this stuff. And so I get a lot of questions that are really deviations from taking action. And then other questions usually contain the answer in the questions. So people will say, can I do this or can I do that? And the answer is always, yes, you can. Try it, experiment, and track your results. And when things are working, rinse and repeat. And when they're not, try something else. And so a lot of people really are asking for permission to experiment. And all my courses start with the requirement, the prerequisite that you're willing to experiment because these techniques are kind of like a bicycle that you get out of the bike store and you have to adjust the handlebars a little bit towards you or away from you and you have to raise the seat or lower the seat and maybe there's some things to do with the gears and, and the, the tightness of the brakes and then it suits you much more, much better. But you can't just take it out of the box and expect to win a race or anything like that. You need to adjust, make adjustments to your own personal learning style. And of course, you're building your own memory palaces based on buildings that you are familiar with. So the principles are universal, but they're mapped onto or you map onto them, your own life, your own personal history. And so it's always that level of personalization and your willingness to experiment with it that gets you the greatest results. And so those are the questions that I get usually something about the science, something about theory, or permission-based questions that have the answer already in them, which is to do it. Yes, you can. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's amazing because once you get into it, and I always tell people to do rather than just think about it and just learn the theory because it's the doing that actually gets you excited and interested and involved. But the theory is, is, is important and uh, you should, you know, if you're interested and you want to learn the theory behind something, and I usually do, but it's the doing that actually helps you learn. I'd like to do a little bit of a deep dive into the courses that I'm looking at here. You have four courses and five memory bonuses. So let's take a look at each one of those. Your first memory course goes over the Magnetic Memory Method Master Plan. This course introduces you to the most powerful memory techniques on Earth. You learn in a friendly setting from a master memory instructor. No stone is left unturned in this introductory course. Now, we talk about memory, and we talk about 
how anybody can improve their memory. You have to exercise your memory in order to improve it. And you mentioned that it's like learning to ride a bicycle. You talk about five stealth secrets for creating memories that last forever. Can you tell us a little bit more about this this particular course? Well, yeah, it was shot in Vienna in uh, oh wow <laughs> in Austria, and it was, it was fantastic. The sound of music uh, land. <laughs> well, I didn't hear any of that in the background, but I mean, it's it's a great place to to be in a very memorable place with Freud and all of that in the background, and I was really happy to be invited to go and do that and and to have it shot live. And so we turned it into an actual video course and it goes into the basics with some very, very specific advanced stuff built into it. So the the construction of well-formed memory palaces is a huge thing because if you can get that right, everything else is going to fall into place. And it's one of my biggest criticisms of all the memory books is that they teach all of these other techniques, but they aren't, they don't seem to have the awareness that every other memory technique can be used inside of a memory palace. And because of that natural ability to, uh, to be able to almost effortlessly recall the structure of locations, then you can place all those other techniques that you're going to use on specific locations inside of memory palaces, which makes everything a lot more powerful. But I go into those other techniques in detail and show how they can be used independently but most specifically inside of memory palaces. And then we talk about in the course some applications to actually studying. What If you're a student, for example, or if you're studying for a professional certification or you just want to improve your professionalism inside of the career path that you've chosen, how to actually apply these memory techniques to what you're doing so that you can create not just – fill your head with knowledge, but be able to recall it and create new knowledge because of the connections that you'll be able to build in your brain using these memory techniques. And then, as I mentioned, we go into advanced techniques and then there's a QA and a session of the most common questions and the troubleshooting that, that you sometimes need when you're working at this. And again, it all comes from personal examples that different people have given and my own personal examples uh, where you need to monkey wrench this and tighten the bolt over here. And so it's, it's, it's quite good. It's a full package and a lot of people have enjoyed that it is also in a live setting. So how many pieces of information do you need to memorize in order to maximize your results? Well, everything needs to be figured out in advance. So you can, well, it doesn't have to be figured out in advance, but it helps a great deal if you are able to have some kind of goal or idea in mind. And one rule of thumb that I always used, and of course it's going to be different for different people, but in my field, when I did my PhD, I was doing film theory, film history, and a lot of philosophy because I focused on the the continental philosophers and how that they talked about literary theory and all of this stuff. And so these are really complicated books. And so as a rule of thumb, I told myself three things from every chapter. And I would then make a calculation. Well, the book has this many chapters. And so I would times that by three and I'd build a memory palace to deal with that amount of information. So it could be 30, it could be 60, whatever the case was, depending on how many chapters the book had. And then I would go through and Sometimes just do it straight into my mind as I was reading, take the information and pop it into a memory palace. Or other times when I knew that I was going to need to write something about this material later, I would keep index cards. And those index cards would be linked to spots in the memory palace so that I could actually write on the index card where in the memory palace it was. Wouldn't need those index cards to access the information, but later when I wanted to write a essay, I could order those index cards in any way that I wanted and just simply refer to the new order. So that's a way to apply it, but it takes a certain amount of preparation and predetermination what you're going to do. So if it was medical terminology, for example, I would look at the requirements and think what of all this technology, uh, terminology, what is going to be the most essential and critical and maybe even ask the professor, you know, for their opinion. They may not be able to tell you, but maybe there are previous exams from previous years that you can go and look at and get an idea and 
be a bit strategic about it and then build your memory palaces around your strategy and how much information you need to memorize so that you have some kind of sense of where you're going and how you're going to get there. Yeah, terminology is, is, a, is a big, big topic because there's terminology in every industry. And even in the computer field, there's terminology aplenty. Scientific field, no matter what field it is, there's terminology everywhere. And that's a big thing. Some people have a hard, hard time learning new terminology. So you talk about dozens of examples on how to use simple images to make information unforgettable. Can you give us one example? Yeah, sure. You know, one of the examples I always love to give because it's it's a perfect one is for the word zerbrechlich in German, which means fragile. And it's a really great example because it's just the craziest word, zerbrechlich, right? And uh, it can be split up into different components, which are zer, bresh, and lish. And so what I did for that particular word was to see a zero, almost like an egg that's a zero. And zero sounds a little bit like zer. And then the zero is whipping the playwright and poet, Brecht, Bertolt Brecht. And uh, he, the uh, the zero is whipping him with licorice. So, <laughs> and as Brecht is being whipped, he's carrying a very fragile vase. And so when you put zero, Brecht, being whipped by licorice, and you know you don't get too worried about well licorice has liquor in it and well, how do I get to the ish part? Your mind kind of organizes it for you, and it just becomes an equation. So, ser bresh lish is is decoded from that image, and the meaning is in the image because it's a fragile vase. And yeah, if you want to go further, because there's another word that's related called. Sebrechlich kite, which is fragileness, then you can tie a kite to this whole operation. And, and and very quickly, you begin to get a lot of words in your mind when you have a path through a memory palace where you go word after word after word. And perhaps you've organized the words as I teach so that they are alphabetically arranged. So it's not just Sebrechlich, but it's also all the other words that start with Z-E-R in German. And same thing with medical terminology you might have a stack of words that start with whatever the case may be, uh, T-A-N or A-C-T or C-A-T, whatever it is. And then you can string them along the journey and have a central figure like a zero or brecht or a cat or whatever it is and have that character move from station to station in the memory palace and engage in these little images that little vignettes little they're not really stories but vignettes that help you recall the sound and the meaning of the word at the same time wow it's amazing you talk about german as a language uh, because i'm trying to learn a few phrases and uh, my girlfriend uh, she has a german background and one of the people that i work with sometimes um, he, he has a german background so <laughs> i'm trying to learn a few german phrases so you also have um, the second course, which is how to learn and memorize the vocabulary of any language. And it's suitable for anyone learning vocabulary of any kind, be it in your mother tongue, French, German, Spanish, etc. And you say that you can literally learn a word once you have it available for recall at any time. Now you talk about how to create 26 letter location memory system. So tell us about that. What is a 26 letter memory location system? We have the benefit of having something totally no-brainer at our fingertips, and that's our alphabet. We know it from a very young age, and it's it's just immediately accessible, A to Z. And so if you were to create a number of memory palaces and each memory palace was linked to a letter, then you could use that letter to associate with the foreign language that you are to words in the foreign language that you're studying and use them and memorize them inside of that palace. So, you know, the number one thing that comes up here is, well, what if I'm learning Japanese or what if I'm learning Chinese or Hindi or whatever language that doesn't use the English alphabet? And that's where the magic really starts to happen because if you step back a little bit and you think about it, there are always representations of what these words sound like in English. You can make them yourself or they exist already, like in the case of 
Chinese and Japanese, there's romanji that people use or pinyin uh, uh, as another example where there's a kind of anglicization that you can use to get yourself into some progress by using your mother tongue and using memory palaces that are based on the English alphabet. So it's just a pre a pre available structure that everybody or virtually everybody has to use and you can organize a lot of information that you want to memorize around that. I recall some words like Ohio which uh, means good morning but it's actually <laughs> it's also a location as well. Mm -hmm. And one of the one of the big things in um, any language is trying to figure out the male, the feminine genders, and mm -hmm. how those apply to objects and things. So in French, you know, that's pretty apparent. La is feminine form, and le, I believe, is the male form. So things like that. Now you talk about getting into that and using some memory strategies for that as well in this particular course. And you talk about a list of resources, including the secret to finding the absolute best dictionary to use when learning and memorizing vocabulary? I thought there was only like a standard dictionaries. Are there some secret dictionaries that we don't know about? There are some very, very special dictionaries that almost nobody uses. And I really, really hope that everybody will get to them as soon as possible. They're called monolingual dictionaries. And they are dictionaries that are written for foreign language speakers or created for foreign language speakers that are very simplified. So as soon as you have 500 or 600 words memorized and learned and in use in a, in a second language, you should be running and not walking to getting a monolingual dictionary at the level that you're at so that you're no longer reading the definitions in your mother tongue, but you're reading the words and the definitions in that language. And a lot of people don't realize that there are dictionaries that are written at simplified levels for second language learners. So where do you find these dictionaries? That is always a good question. But uh, I have some secrets that help you f f go through that process, which, uh, you know, is a, is a bit of a trial and error thing. But it's not always that easy, but it is almost always possible. Okay, so th these are not readily available online. You have to know how to find them. Pretty much. And uh once you once you've got one in your possession you'll understand exactly why it's so very very powerful in terms of getting boosts in your fluency and you also talk about how to use actors other public figures and famous pieces of artwork to help you memorize vocabulary tell us a little bit about that not everybody knows who brecht is but everybody knows who al pacino is and everybody knows who Kiefer sutherland is or you know most people know and everybody knows obama and michael jackson and what you can do is just use these people in your images in ways that help you recall the sound and meaning of different words. And things are very, very memorable if you have them interacting with each other. So Michael Jackson and Obama in a fist fight or <laughs> n naked mud wrestling is not going to leave your mind very soon, especially if I tell you that they're being rained upon by hot dogs the size of zebras. And, <laughs> you know, like it's just the crazier it is and the more familiar you are with the people engaged in the image, then the more memorable it becomes. Now, you also have a course on how to memorize names and faces. It's the one area that I have a hard time. When I meet people, I unless I see them or talk to them on a regular basis, I don't tend to remember their names. And um, even famous bands, rock bands, I like classic rock, but I can never remember every single name of each rock band or the singers. So this is a big area for a lot of people remembering names. Now, how do you, um, now you talk about simple examples of complex names to walk you through the process. Now, tell us a little bit about this particular course. Well, there's different techniques for memorizing names and some of them are classic. You know, you hear a name and then you create a rhyme for it. So John is wrong or something like that, which is a half rhyme, but something or, you know, sad Vlad or Mary, 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 and just different things like that where you make a kind of rhyme or half rhyme. And that's okay, but it's not nearly as good as being able to create an image that like with the other examples, allows you to recreate the sound of the name. 
and bring it to mind. And so one of the things that I never really liked was Harry Lorraine's idea that you create an exaggerated image on the person's face. But that leads to you looking at the person's face while in your imagination you're uh, uh, thinking of something very crude and <laughs> often <laughs> unpleasant. So I often put that image on the person's shoulder instead or somewhere behind them so that uh, we're not fouling up that the, that person's integrity in our imagination because it can have an effect when you're talking to someone and you know you want you want to as part of good social conduct be able to use their name and as you're recalling their name you're looking at you know whatever on their face some crazy image that can communicate to them some kind of weird psychosis in your <laughs> approach. So if you put it at least on their shoulder or behind them on the wall or whatever, then, then you can reduce that, uh, that strange look in your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Plus you want to remember what they look like, right? <laughs> and if you try to superimpose something on top, right. Even maybe the mannerisms, the way they talk and the way they walk or the way they look. So sometimes you just want to remember a name and associate the name with the face. But sometimes you also want to remember some other details as well. Yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of things that can be useful, whether a person has a ring on or whether they have some dust on their cuffs of their sleeve because they maybe are a violinist or what, or for whatever reason they might have dust. And these things can be very, very useful if you're a reporter or a writer or a psychic, which I don't recommend anybody take up the job <laughs> of, of psychic, but psychics use memory techniques. They, they will notice watches, rings, jewel, jewelry of all kind, different clues and signs that show them ideas about what career that person might be in. So that later in the session, if the person has their hands in their pocket or whatever, they have all those details memorized and ready to go to surprise and shock that person with their intimate knowledge, which is was totally on the surface the entire time, but still sounds surprising later. Have you ever watched Sherlock, the British uh, TV series? I have, and uh, not as many episodes as I should, but it's certainly I know the, uh, the Sherlock methodology uh, very well from the books. In, in that actual show... In Sherlock, the British TV series with Cumberbatch, he uses memory palaces. You know, there's scenes when he's actually visualizing everything and going through everything in his mind, and they show it as a projection on TV because you can use all these special effects and everything else. <laughs> so it's it's an amazing visualization of, I guess, memory palaces. It's pretty cool. So you also talk about two methods alone that are worth the entire price of Magnetic Memory Method Masterclass. Can you tell us a little bit about those two methods? Well, basically, one of the reasons why memory techniques don't work for a lot of people is because they're tensed up and they're not relaxed. So if you can overcome that, then everything will work a lot better for you. And so that really is the the price of the course many, many times over is just being able to be relaxed when you're using these techniques. And there are specific processes that work very, very well for memory. And the beauty of it is, is that if as you learn the techniques and as you practice them, you're relaxed and as you use them, let's say you're memorizing information for an exam or a test or a professional certification, if you use the relaxation techniques while you're studying, then you can use them while you're in the situation of recall and you essentially condition yourself to be relaxed whenever you're using your memory. And so that increases your success phenomenally. And so in other words, if you're any kind of athlete or any kind of professional, if you're stressed and tensed, your performance goes down. And so this really makes the difference for so many people. And I get letters all the time by people who say, you know, I, took your advice and I used these approaches to relaxation and it just made all the difference in the world. It wasn't working before that, but once I got into this, which very few people really want to do it immediately because it sounds kind of corny, but it does make all the difference in the world. And people who use it in combination with the memory techniques, they report much better results. Now you can get great results without doing it, but this is the game changer. This is where you go into the 
the level on top of the level and see how to get even higher than that. Because relax, we just know this from all kinds of fields of performance that if you're not relaxed, then you, you break bones and you pull muscles. And it's the same thing with what goes on in your mind. Your memory course number four talks about how to learn and memorize poetry. Why poetry? Well, it's basically a very good exercise for learning how to memorize verbatim text. So if you want to be able to memorize every single word in a paragraph or a speech, then one of the best ways to learn how to do that is with poetry, because poetry is not just about word for word, line by line, but it's also just very, very specific and specialized words that are designed to have certain emotional effects and certain conceptual and intellectual effects at specific times in the line. And there are other techniques that go on in poetry that really give you a bit of a stretch. And you can use that experience and those techniques in order to memorize anything verbatim. So it could be a very specific dictionary or encyclopedia definition for a specialized term in your field, or it could be an entire speech. But I start this with the poetry. I, I, I could just change it to how to learn and memorize verbatim text, but it's not nearly as sexy or interesting as poetry. Well, you can also use it to memorize jokes, limericks, lyrics, quotes, which is a big, big topic. Uh, a lot of people like quotes, special quotes. And uh, even if you wanted to um, maybe use Shakespeare quotes. <laughs> I know some people use, I've seen online, some people use uh, Shakespeare quotes as insults. And people don't don't really know what they are. <laughs> but, right, right. <laughs> the best, really, for anybody who is interested is in uh, is is Kent's insults in King Lear. You got to check that out because <laughs> he he goes on for quite some time with Lily Livered this, and it's just <laughs> absolutely the best string of insults that I've ever come across in my life. Definitely something I should memorize. <laughs> oh, I got to look that up. <laughs> Now, you also have um, five memory bonuses. You have how to memorize numbers, equations, simple arithmetic, how to memorize the terminology of any profession, the ultimate language learning secret, the magnetic memory method newsletter. You have a newsletter. And how to remember your dreams. Quite a lot of material. You have the four courses, and then you have five memory bonuses. I remember when I was going through college in the UK in the late 70s, I was doing my A-levels, and... Uh, Mathematics was my, was my number one subject. What I used to do was summarize the formulas and how to, you know, solve problems. I used to summarize those, and I used to play darts. And then I used to go over each formula or each paragraph that I needed to learn. I used a repetition. I repeated it, repeated it until I memorized it while I was playing darts. Then I would go to the second formula or second paragraph, and I would repeat the first paragraph as well as the second one until I remembered both of them. Then I repeated the process until I remembered everything that I had summarized. At the same time, I was doing something enjoyable. I was playing darts. So that was, you know, the combination of both. Now, what's the best method for memorizing numbers and using simple shapes you talk about to memorize numbers? Well, it's always a question of what are the numbers that are involved and are there equations involved and basically what is it that you need to memorize? And there are some classic there are some classic strategies for memorizing numbers that involve something called the major method, which is assigning sounds to certain numbers, like the numbers 0 to 9 each get a particular sound or set of sounds. And when you combine those sounds together, you make words, and you can use those words to make images. And from there, you're able to memorize any word, or sorry, any number of any length. And there's also other systems where people assign actors or politicians to numbers from 0 to 99, or there's many, many different systems that people use. But for the simple purposes of everyday life, I think that the major method is more than enough. But of course, I teach how to link it to the memory palace method, which is relatively uncommon in the memory trainings. And I actually haven't come across it except for in one book in particular. So I've really maximized the training on that level. So you could use something like this to learn pi to so many digits. Yes. And that's one of the 
com- competitive areas that a lot of memory competitions have is they either use pi or they use some digit that goes into the thousands of numbers. Wow. You also get into how to memorize terminology, and that's a big topic as well. The ultimate language learning secrets. Um, yeah, you've got quite a lot of material here. Now, tell us about the newsletter. You have a newsletter, the Magnetic Memory Method newsletter. What do you get from that? Well, these are the back issues of the newsletter. And for two years, I wrote about memory every single day and sent it out to my email list. And so I've collected all those messages together in the newsletter. And there's over 700 pages there. Wow. People have found this to be an incredible resource. And people email me to this day saying, you know, what happened to it? And why don't you do it anymore? And oh, they wish that they had that daily reminder and that daily new bit of insight to be able to memorize information better and to understand memory in the field of memory and memory training a lot better. And well, One of the things I do now instead is a weekly podcast, and that's uh, helping people even more in an audio format. But the newsletters are still available inside of the masterclass for reading. And a lot of people find it uh, the ultimate manual, really, for going deep and daily inspiration and daily insight. And it's like those old daily bread things that churches had to go along with the Bible to accompany all the different verses that that uh, people read so they have deeper insight into the context and, and just inspiration about how to use that information in your daily life. Wow. Tell us more about your podcast. Well, the podcast is next week is officially one year old and... I was really surprised to look at the stats that in a, in a year, 150,000 downloads of the various episodes. Wow. And I've had a lot of guests. I've interviewed a lot of people. I've even interviewed Harry Lorraine, and that was fantastic. And different people in the world of memory and experts in the field of language learning and how that they use different approaches to memory techniques to help them, a lot of polyglots. And... So that's been great. And I've also just done my own episodes, answering people's questions and going into different areas of memory and things that touch my life personally, my story, how I got into memory, how it, how it affects or helps in my position as someone with bipolar disorder and having to go through changes in mood and how the memory palace technique has really been a great fixture in or in terms of getting through grad school when I needed to pass these exams and sometimes being in a really bad shape in a, in a depression and still having a place to go to access my memory and the things that I had worked so hard to learn that had been you know thrown out by a tsunami or were inaccessible in a dark haze. And so I talk about that a fair amount on the podcast and the ongoing adventure with that actually. And it's really helped a lot of people who don't get to hear a lot about that aspect in the world in general, because there's so much stigmatism to that condition. So yeah, stuff like that on the podcast. And what's it called? The Magnetic Memory Method Podcast. Awesome. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. Now, you also talk about how to remember your dreams. Uh, Do you get into lucid dreaming here? No, I'm actually a bit of a controversial voice. And I often get emails about this because I talk about, you know, why? Why would you want to lucid dream when you're in control of your life all day long? Wouldn't it be nice to just remember more of what happens in your mind when you're not in control of your life? (laughs) I kind of contest the value of being in control of your dreams. And obviously, there's great value in it and there's there's interesting and wonderful things that you can do but at the end of the day it's never appealed to me nearly as much as being able to remember what you dream when you're out of control because it's this completely different life completely different set of lives and it's astounding what goes on when you be, are able to recall your dreams and how that actually being able to recall your dreams influences the character and the depth and the extent of the dreams that you have. It really, really deeply affects you in ways that don't happen with lucid dreaming. So I'm always kind of disappointed when I lucid dream and prefer to be able to understand and recall all of the goofy and strange and sometimes very deep and dramatic and touching things that go on in in my dreams that would be lost otherwise without advanced dream recall. 
That's awesome. What I'd like to do is go over some of the the techie side of your courses. What was the biggest mistake you made when you started creating your online masterclass? Well, it was waiting too long to outsource people who are experts in achieving the things that I needed. That was the number one problem. And did you have a workflow when you created these uh, courses? Uh, what you wanted to put in them? What, what did you wanted to add as bonus material? Yeah, well, all of the courses were based on books that previously existed or parts of books. And so that was very quick and easy. Well, I wouldn't say quick and easy in a flippant sense, but they were relatively quick and easy to put together because I was so deeply familiar with the material from years of using it myself and then having written books about it. So it was just following the books basically and speaking from my own knowledge of it, adding little details here and there, but the courses made themselves. And how long did you take to finish your courses? Well, each one has a different uh, amount of time spent on it, but the first one I had to learn ScreenFlow. So that was the longest and I spent a little bit longer than a month on it. And after that, I can do sometimes courses in as little as a week, but I usually spend two to three weeks on a new course. And why did you decide to self-host as opposed to uploading your course to, or courses to sites such as Linda or Udemy? Well, I do have the courses individually on Udemy. The reason I got into self-hosting it was, well, there's, there's multiple reasons, but one of the main ones is, is that one should always have their own real estate because these other sites that host things for you, they can disappear overnight or they can change a rule that they have overnight that wipes everything out for you. So you've really got to think, if you're not already thinking about it, you should be thinking about getting things onto your own site so that you have your own real estate, I would call it. And not be at the mercy of having all your eggs in other people's baskets. I hear that all the time. It's it's good to have your own space and your own platform and then work from there. So how do you market your course? What's been most successful? Social media, blog posts, webinars, or something else? I do almost no social media. I mean, I have a Facebook page. I've got a couple hundred likes and I tweet here and there and uh, G plus and all that, but that's mostly just good SEO practice, but social media is not uh, really a big thing. I get a lot of traffic from YouTube, but I wouldn't consider it social media. I just offer short videos uh, about this topic. And often I just make short little videos telling people that there's a new episode of the podcast or there's a new post on the website. And those videos are coded with a invitation to a landing page that offers a free memory kit. So I get a lot of subscribers that way. And the podcast brings a lot of traffic because people really like that content and they want to see what's going on on the website. And of course, I have written versions of the podcast. I speak very freely on the podcast, but I I either write down a written version later or I'm riffing on a written version. So there's text to read as well for people who don't like to listen to podcasts, but they somehow have come across it anyway, or they'd rather have a written record or refer to the written material later. So I make that available. And I was requested that a lot. So that's why I started doing it. And other than that, uh, traffic also comes from my Amazon books. And my Amazon books all have the invitation to download some worksheets, which you can't really have worksheets in Kindle books anyway. So there's uh, the invitation to come and download them from there. And those are my main sources of traffic. Eventually, I'll get into buying ads. But uh, for now, it's worked really, really well. That's great. Looking back, what was the one tool, software or hardware that you absolutely needed to create your online courses? Well, it'd be unfair to say that there was one tool. It's really a combination of them all together. But in terms of the actual creation of the videos, I would say ScreenFlow was the most critical tool and the best that I ever worked with. I tried other free options, but at the end of the day, you got to have a bit of skin in the game and always work towards getting the best or better said, the thing that you are actually going to use to get the results that you're looking for. So ScreenFlow has been amazing for that. Yeah, that's an awesome tool, ScreenFlow. I actually use it myself. 
how do you support your course members? Uh, do you have a private forum or Facebook group? No, I don't do those sorts of things. I, I help with people. I help people on an individual basis, and there's a coaching option if people want to take that. And there's also people who do take coaching, and I ask them their permission to record the coaching sessions. And these are placed in a special area of the master class called the mastermind. And that is, uh, is an upgrade that people can take. And then they have access to these recorded sessions and, and their own personal sessions with me. And also these, the people who belong to this second upgraded area are also, I'm going to start doing private webinars just for them. And uh, people in the master class will be invited if they want to come to these webinars and they'll go over questions that have come in and some special new additions that I want to add to their knowledge base. And the webinars will be recorded and placed in this exclusive area as well. And people email me and I do the best to support them. And as more and more material uh, emerges, I'm able more and more to to point them to resources that already exist on the website or on the podcast. Yeah, that's there's there's all kinds of support. I'm actually <laughs> quite acknowledged as uh, being over the top in terms of response and depth of response. So it's been a lot of fun. Sounds great. Sounds excellent. So Anthony, take a few minutes and offer your best, most practical advice to anyone thinking of creating their first online course or training. My best advice would be to see if you can give it away as a book first and sell it as a book first. Because even though it can be very quick and easy and fun to make a video course, there is time involved and there's sweat and there's experimentation and then there's the uploading to different platforms and fussing around with product or video descriptions. And if you're using Udemy, there's quizzes to be made and, and you got to follow all of these kind of guidelines that these hosting platforms have. And you don't know yet whether anybody actually wants this from you. So I would test with a book first. And if you can't give it away, then you probably can't sell it. Great advice. Well, Anthony, we have come to the end of the show. I would love to keep talking with you, and I know you have a ton of things you can teach us all. Thank you so much for being on the show and sharing such valuable insights and advice. It has been a real pleasure speaking with you. Where can people reach you online? Well, the best place is to come to magneticmemorymethod.com. At the top of the page, you'll see a option to register for a four free video series, and you can learn more about building memory palaces and yeah, you can find out about the podcast and all kinds of stuff over at magneticmemorymethod.com. Thanks for listening to Education Hackers. Check out the show notes and click the love it button at educationhackers.com to send us some iTunes love. Until next time.